rooted in the past and growing into the future, the church must always be reformed in order to live out the love of Christ in an ever-changing world. We celebrate the good news of God's grace that Jesus Christ sets us free every day to do this life-transforming work. Trusting in the freedom given to us in baptism, we pray for the church that Christians will unite more fully in worship and mission. Be still. We come to quiet ourselves in this haven of holiness. Let's try the call to worship again. Be still. Be still and know Be still and know that God is our hope, our help, our refuge, and our Redeemer. This morning we will be using Holy Communion Setting 1 as found in our Evangelical Lutheran Worship Book as well as on the screen. And we continue now with confession and forgiveness. And as you are able, I invite you to stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Dear friends, let us confess and acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven, and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn on this Reformation Sunday is 505, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. can we 
And peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the promised gifts of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our service continues with the hymn of praise. This is the feast. be with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear God's word to us this morning. Our first lesson today is from Jeremiah. The days are surely come, says the Lord, when we will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though it was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their inequity and re remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Behold the one who makes wars to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Here ends the psalm. Today's second lesson is from Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has been passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove to the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what works? No, but by the faith, law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As you are able, let us stand together and sing the gospel acclamation. reading from the Holy Gospel according to John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never seen sl been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free. Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Allow me to begin this morning by asking you a question, and the question may seem a little bit uh, late to the game, perhaps. But what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? I suspect that this question has been posed to each of us here this morning at one time or another. Luckily, when we were probably still young enough to be filled with fanciful dreams, right? Little child, what do you want to be when you grow up? Of course, if you're anything like me and as a child, your response to this question was always changing, always evolving. My earliest memories convinced me that at around my son's age, right around seven, I wanted nothing more than to be a firefighter. I suspect it had more to do with the big truck and the cool equipment than it did with actually fighting fires. My mom recalls when I decided at around the age nine that I was going to be a magician. She thought, and bought me all of the gear that I would need for Christmas, but when I couldn't master that little trick with the ball under the cup, you know that one, right? Where you have to make the ball disappear. I soon realized that top hats and white rabbits probably worked for me. And when I was still undecided about this ministry thing, I also dreamt of being a world-renowned archaeologist, not just a normal one, a world-renowned archaeologist, digging in the dirt, uncovering that which had once, what we once believed had been lost and forgotten. But let's be honest, I really just wanted to find some dinosaur bones. Of course, these are just a few examples. Add to that list a rock star, an author, a doctor, a teacher, an architect, an artist, as well as a marketing executive, and you will begin to catch a glimpse of my early childhood aspirations. Because let me tell you, when someone was brave enough to ask me, little boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, then they had better sit down. Because I was always willing to tell them. And so let me ask you another question, similar and yet strikingly different. Dear friends, what do you want the church to be when it grows up? Or even better yet, what does God want the church to be right now? These aren't 
new questions. In fact, I would argue that these are precisely the same sorts of questions that Martin Luther wrestled with 505 years ago. When he gave more weight to God's grace than to the heftiness of our pocketbooks, Luther answered this question. When he preached of faith as the foundation of our salvation rather than works, Luther answered this question. And when he reminded us of Scripture's authority over and above all else, Luther answered this question. His ideas were big, they were bold, they were different, and believe it or not, for their time, they were actually quite modern. In many ways, when Luther stood up and proclaimed salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, and thereby called the church to live, to live as he believed Christ dreamt for them to live, he was a lot like you, or like me, or like any wide-eyed child who was filled with bold and wonderful aspirations. His dreams were big, and he was free to dream them because he believed that his God was even You know, I think that we allowed ourselves to dream big dreams when we were young because when we were young, someone told us that anything was possible. Anything was possible. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Maybe it was a, a parent, a teacher, a babysitter, a friend. As children, we dreamt big because we believed. Beloved children of God, I know that the road hasn't always been easy. There have been bumps, changes, potholes, craters, and much loss and grief along this journey of faith. But God's good news and it really is good news, is that our God has been, is, and will always be with us. We will never be alone. Which means that we too, modern day disciples, are still free to dream about the future of God's church, in God's world, and to dream big, bold, audacious, beautiful dreams. Just let our readings this morning be our guide. I can't help but notice that if those earliest disciples wouldn't have dreamed along with Christ, then they may never have heard those gospel words of freedom. They may have never experienced healing, and they may have never known the depths of God's grace. Just think about that for a moment. If they had given up on the possibilities of God, then the prophet Jeremiah wouldn't have had reason to declare God's power to reunite God's people. Nor would the Romans have entrusted God with the forgiveness of their sins. Martin Luther wouldn't have bothered to hold the church accountable. The reformers wouldn't have risked their lives, and quite possibly, if the saints before us had given up believing in the greatness of our God, then we might not even be gathered here this morning. But they didn't stop believing. And dear friends, we can't stop believing either. For despite all else that may change in the world around us, and my goodness, you have experienced a lot God is still eternal. God's grace still frees us. Faith in Christ still saves us. 
And the word which was once made flesh continues to guide us all of our days. The good news this morning is that we are free. Free indeed. And that means that our dreams can be big when we are ready. And that our ideas can be bold and that our actions should be courageous because our God is just as great as our God has always been. So let me ask you again the question that I started with. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to leave for our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren? What does God call the church to be today? It was 505 years ago, and according to tradition, that Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses onto the door of a German sanctuary. And that's a long time ago. A very long time ago. But siblings in Christ, the echoes of that moment still resonate here in our midst today. And having been liberated by God's grace, we are still free to dream. Though our great aspirations may no longer involve fire trucks or magic tricks or dinosaur bones, we can indeed dream and pray and trust and work for a world and a church that extends its embrace far and wide. For a voice that speaks with persistence and prophetic power for hands that are willing to share the abundance of God's overwhelming goodness and for lives lived to the glory of God and for the sake of God's beloved people. If you leave here this morning and can only remember one thing, remember this, that you are loved unconditionally by a God who is greater than even our deepest fears and that if we listen we can still hear that small voice assuring us that with our God all things truly are possible and so this morning on a Reformation day that certainly feels very different than Reformation days before. We will still celebrate the events of 1517 in all of their glory. We'll sing some of our favorite hymns and enjoy the sanctuary adorned in red, because in doing so, we'll find strength in the promise of a God who continues to stir up the Spirit from within our midst. And it is my prayer that you may seek God's purpose and search out God's mission. It is my prayer that you may find comfort in the assurance that God is with you as you hold one another and as you hold Pastor John's family in prayer and love, as you grieve together and share those most cherished memories with one another. And it is my Reformation prayer that sent forth with God's blessing, we may also be sent forth into God's world to live out the gospel, to share God's most perfect love, and to live in the light of God's most amazing grace. You are loved. Happy Reformation. And may that reformation continue with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word, number 517. Please rise. Thank you.
In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. God, our fortress, we pray for the church. Write your laws of love on the hearts of your people, that we remain steadfast in our witness to your grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your mercy is great. God, our refuge and strength, we pray for the nations. Where they are in uproar, bring wise leadership and comfort for those in distress. Make wars to cease and peace to enter every land. Hear us, O God. God, our Redeemer, we pray for this congregation. Bless all who are preparing for baptism or the affirmation of their baptism. Open their hearts to your Holy Spirit. Teach them your word and give them courage to proclaim their faith. Hear us, O God. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you saw when you entered the church this morning, the offering plates are no, now located in the narthex, where you may offer a gift as you are able. And at this time, I ask you to remain standing as the ushers bring forth the gifts that we have received. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places 
give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name as we join their unending hymn. the beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us full of grace and full of truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Holy Spirit. And as we have been taught, so let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to come to the Lord's table to receive the true presence of Christ in bread and wine for the forgiveness of sin and the promise of new life in Jesus Christ. This is a sacrament of love and thanksgiving. Therefore, this is not a command that we all must receive it, but rather an invitation to partake of what Christ has already freely given. Christ invites you to this table. Come, taste, and see. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
Beloved children of God, when I say the words, body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you, I would ask that you respond with amen. And at this time, I direct you to take the bread and wine that has been prepared for you. Please take the piece of bread and hear these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. Now please take the cup that has been prepared for you and hear these words. This is the blood of Christ, which has been shed for you. Amen. Let us join in singing together our distribution hymn number 591, That Priceless Grace. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. I invite you to be seated for several announcements. So the services here will begin at 9.45, as we did this morning with the hymn sing going forward, and worship will begin at 10 a.m., and there will be no children's message uh, for the time being. Sunday school continues every second week, starting next week. A thank you from uh, the folks in the office who prepared these wonderful announcements for me for your continued support encouragement and prayers over these past few weeks. Uh, the third quarter statements are in the narthex for pickup. And there are memorial cards for Pastor John for those who would like one in the office. And they're just on the desk there. And I understand that Kathy and Carla would like to say a few words on behalf of the council. Um, we would like to thank Pastor Snook for being with us today to support our congregation. Thanks also to Synod and Bishop Price for their amazing support during this time of grief for us and for them as well. Um, Pastor Jennifer Hoover will be here next week, November the 6th, for All Saints Sunday. And Pastor Doug Rebley will be with us on November 13th uh, from Synod. The Synod's priority is to support us and assure us that we are not alone, um, that they are always going to be there um, to assure that, that we have what we need and um, we will uh, certainly uh, need their support uh, in the next little while. Uh, we will keep you updated uh, with any further news from Synod and um, if we, uh, we would certainly appreciate uh, your support as well at this time. We are all so very sad and still shocked at the sudden passing of our beloved Pastor John. Many of us feel lost, our faith a little bit shaken as we process the question, why Pastor John and why now? But we are not alone we have each other. And Pastor John expanded and enhanced the St. Matthew's Church family with his light, his joy, and his heart. He strengthened the bonds between all of us, and we are forever joined together, heart to heart, with the Holy Spirit. Pastor John had a great vision for St. Matthew's, a safe place for all to worship, witness God's love, and grow in faith. And we as council plan to continue to support his vision and now legacy as we move forward. We will find the perfect pastor to take over the spiritual reins and further enhance our St. Matthew's family. So know that we will be working hard on your behalf to continue the work of St. Matthew's. And just for council members, there will be a short meeting after church today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Know that you are prayed for. Know that you are cared for. And know that you are loved. You do not walk this road alone. You walk with one another. You walk with the memories you have and the lessons you've learned and the gifts you've been given. And you walk with your God who is with you each and every step of the way. And that doesn't make it any easier, but I hope it makes it less lonely. 
for you do have companions who walk with you as you figure out what happens next. And as you take time to give thanks for a life that has been lived to the glory of God and that has been such a gift to St. Matthew's and to Hanover and to this ministry area and to God's church and to God's people. And as you remember those lessons and you carry all of that in your heart and you live those things out, Pastor John is indeed the legacy of Pastor John does continue to live on through you. You share his love and his laughter and his wonderful voice and all of the gifts that he brought to this world. And those live on through you. And I'm so grateful for that. <sighs> Let's sing our sending hymn. The Church of Christ in Every Age. It's number 729. And as you are able, I invite you to stand. But if you just need to sit and dry your eyes and just hear the music, that's okay too. Let us sing together. Thanks be to God. And may the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of peace with those around us.